So welcome everyone. Uh, it's fantastic to have such a good attendance. And um, I invite my fellow panelists to unmute and show themselves. Uh, over to Jazz. Hi everyone, welcome, uh, welcome to this panel as part of the week-long SOAS Festival of Ideas. Um, salam, Minglaba to everyone. I think we already have a, a nice, nicely dispersed global, global audience joining us for the panel session today. I'm thrilled to join uh, this panel. The topic of our conversation is whose knowledge matters. Um, in a world where knowledge is deeply implicated um, in and subject to relations of power, inequality and exclusion, we are hoping today to open up a critical space for reflection, engagement and exchange about structures, systems, processes that kind of help sustain these hierarchies of knowledge, right? And our panelists will talk about their experiences with this transnationally, nationally, but also locally, and also the work that they're involved in, in trying to overcome this challenge. Um, you'll see we're an all-women panel, um, and my colleagues range from the UK, Myanmar, and Ethiopia. So we're kind of trying, uh, trying to embody the spirit of decolonizing knowledge in the composition of our panel, um, and, you know, kind of starts that conversation going. Um, I think there are just a couple of housekeeping things to let everyone know about, which is that we, it, there is a packed schedule this week for the SOAS Festival of Ideas, you'll be pleased to know. So we do have to vacate this particular Zoom room at 2.45 at the very latest, um, ready to set up for Neelam Hussain's keynote lecture. Um, I would encourage everyone to connect with each other on the chat using the chat function. But if you have questions for the panelists, if you could confine that to the Q&A, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen in, in the row of, of various things, so participants, Q&A um, and chat. Um, the format for the panel, um, I'll introduce everyone, but we have uh, Professor Emma Crew who is, uh, well, everyone actually here is, uh, is a colleague of mine. And I, I think I go so far as to say that friends uh, from the Global Research Network on Parliaments and People. Professor Emma Crew is director of GRNPP, um, also professor in the Department of Anthropology um, at SOAS. Miet Thetpitsa is director of the Enlightened Myanmar Research Foundation in Myanmar and uh, Suet Haile Selassie um, received a grant under the aegis of GRMPP um, about empowering youth in, in Ethiopia's kind of peace and political processes. Um, each panelist will talk for about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, please look forward to a very lively, thoughtful, engaged session. Um, we all know each other very well and we disagree with each other on many things. So. It will be very lively, and I really encourage everyone to get involved with all of us. Um, and I thank you. Uh, one small personal note from myself, uh, an apology. We have workmen in the house, so there may be some various bagging noise going on. So please forgive me in advance for that. Um, so without further ado, um, I think we'll follow, Emma will start, followed by Miet Fett, followed by Suet. So Emma, over to you. Thank you so much, Jazz. And thank you also to Amina for organizing this incredible festival and for inviting us uh, onto this panel uh, at which I'm gonna kick off by talking about knowledge, hierarchies of knowledge. And I first started thinking about this um, when, I, when I was working in international development. So I'm an anthropologist by training but I'm also a, an activist in practice. And um, when I was combining these two hats in international development, I noticed that knowledge in the world of technology development, as an example, is evaluated 
by the source of its production, not by whether or not it's deemed useful, not therefore by its utility. So to give an example, inventions by mostly male engineers from Europe were labeled modern technology and automatically useful apparently. But those that were invented uh, by female rural energy users that I was working with were labeled traditional culture and had to be evaluated before they it was decided whether or not they were useful or not. To give a more specific example, I, I witnessed a male engineer who I worked with um, photographing a hood that was put over a stove, uh, a cooking stove, to channel polluting smoke out of the house. And uh, he referred to this as traditional. He said, oh, look, here's some traditional indigenous knowledge. Even though when I talked to the person who designed it, who was a cook, a, a, a woman who, who was using the stove herself, she actually only designed it a few weeks earlier. He repackaged this invention, this hood, and he produced it in a difficult, a different uh, material. And once it passed through what I came to see as the kind of magical ritualized processes of a project, it then became modern technology. So in the kind of funding application, it was, it was, it was now uh, transformed into modern technology, exact, almost exactly the same invention. And it was now ready to be distributed to um, poor people. Technological appropriation is rife in my experience. And anthropologists have been writing about this for decades, but politically I've come to realize you sometimes have to keep repeating the same findings if they're not making a, a strong enough mark on people. And there's a political economy, of course, to this. So the international development and aid industry still rests on the need for aid agencies to allocate a large amount of their aid, they think, to their own national experts on the assumption that they have some kind of superior knowledge. And there's a sort of automatic process to this rather than, than an evaluation uh, of the specific knowledge. Um, so this, these hierarchies of knowledge are gendered, racialized and produced by class. And as we all know, this is then part of the dialectical process of the reproduction of those very inequalities alongside new ones. It was true 30 years ago, it remains true today. And in our neo-colonial world, this is no small matter. These hierarchies of knowledge cost lives because lives are, are lost if money is wasted effectively. If we are serious about Black Lives Matter and the related movements that challenge white supremacy, then I think subverting how we think about knowledge has to be part of decolonizing. This is not icing, this is really core. Um, so my final point really is about international research funding. Similar patterns happen in international research funding that occur in development projects. They are also um, premised on the false assumption that European scholars have superior expertise. So international development research, where, when it involves Europe, European, or in our case, UK scholars researching in other people's countries in Africa, Asia, Middle East, and, and South Central America, apparently need to now do things like develop the capacity of researchers in their sites of inquiry. It's an assumption rather than something that can be explored in practice. Five years ago, I wanted to prove that these assumptions in international research were wrong and damaging. It's important, obviously, to generate evidence that undermines these racist assumptions. So I ran a project in, in Bangladesh and Ethiopia, and I designed it with uh, Ruth Fox from Hansard Society. But because of the way research funding is organized, uh, it was really, really too difficult to do this in a highly equitable way. I mean, effectively, 
uh, Ruth and I designed this project and we commissioned our colleagues in Bangladesh and Ethiopia to do their research. And however much we encouraged them to really come up with their own ideas, we still had too much influence on the design. They didn't have genuine freedom to pursue what John Dewey calls their animating questions in their inquiries. It was frustrating. So in, in, nine, in 2017, I started a new program called Deepening Democracy. And this time it was more genuinely planned with colleagues from the UK, but also India, Ethiopia, and Myanmar. And one of the principal architects was Mia Thet Titsar, who's also on this panel. Um, and Mia Thet and I made some sacred pledges to each other, which we hold each other to uh, in that proposal. And, and that was to, to really create opportunities for scholars in Myanmar and in Ethiopia, not just in this case to give grants to older men in the capitals, in Yangon and in Addis Ababa, but also to give grants and where relevant, where requested, mentoring and training, et cetera, to younger women, to people from ethnic minorities and to people in very inaccessible universities and, and NGOs in the two countries. And it was really hard work and the hard work was mostly done by Mit Thet and her, and her colleagues but we did manage to alert thousands of people in, in both countries to this opportunity. My point here is that part of this was about training for sure, but what was interesting was that it was training in fundraising. It was training in getting access to this funding that was really empowering. So I wanna just end by showing a short film about what happened when we gave these grants to scholars in these two countries uh, so that you can see uh, a little bit about what they did. The most significant finding of this research for me is that if you give scholars in places like Myanmar and Ethiopia a chance to do their own research, they can produce astounding results because talent is equally distributed around the world. So why wouldn't they? The outside world is closing in and Kalashnikovs cannot really help us. But I found a new weapon and I want to give my people a voice. I found the camera more powerful than Kalashnikov. I trained as a social anthropologist in the late 1980s and then I worked in development and then jumped to studying parliament. I realised that people having a really close look behind the scenes is actually really good for parliament. That kind of scrutiny is very good for democracy. For the last five years, I've been running international research coalitions at SOAS in the anthropology department. I became really conscious of how important scrutiny of political institutions and political processes is. One of the really significant projects is run by an incredible team who we met at a conference. Oli Salari Olibui and Tesvahun Hailu became friends and put in an application for a proposal based on their research about the Mursi in Ethiopia. The Mursi are an extremely marginalised group of people who are subjected to land grabs and harassment. And this coalition between an anthropologist and theatre studies lecturer and a pastoralist filmmaker and now playwright is the most innovative example of research I've ever encountered. All too often you get artists and filmmakers kind of asked to disseminate findings right at the end of the project. But the beauty of this one is that they're working in collaboration from the very start of the application throughout the process of the research. We began to realise that our grantees were beginning to have significant impact. So we designed a new programme which was about reducing inequalities in public engagement. And we collected together the artists and the scholars who had been working in our
programme for a huge arts festival. It was the first of its kind in Myanmar. And what was politically significant was that they raised the issue of the rights of ethnic minorities in Myanmar, including the Rohingya, which is an extremely sensitive topic in the country. One of the programmes that we funded is run by Mercy Mulugeta, and it's called Bridge, and it's incredibly timely. It's a very innovative programme about creating a web-based platform for politicians and citizens to discuss and they do it entirely online. So the significance of this platform is that it's moderated in a way to really encourage people to focus on content, uh, but to do so in a way that allows the conversation to move forward and doesn't get stuck just in insults. SOAS really supports us in our ambition to give opportunities to scholars in Africa, Asia and Latin America to do their own research. They're not used to doing this, so it's well worth giving advice and support. But also what's very interesting about giving national researchers an opportunity to study their own political systems is that they have a really deep understanding of the local issues. So they don't make assumptions that democracy means the same thing that it means to us, for example, in the UK. They come up with vernacular ideas about how democracy needs to develop in their specific place. On that note, with me looking a little bit locked down crazy, I'm gonna pass back to Jazz. Oh, okay, we had a slight musical interlude there. I don't know where that came from, Jess. <laughs> um, that was a nice, nice gentle segue. Thanks so much, um, Emma. Um, I propose that actually we move uh, straight to me at Bet and then to sue it. Um, so that actually, instead of uh, each of the panelists kind of fielding their own individual questions, we can put them all together and bring them into into conversation. If everyone, uh, if everyone would find that helpful. Um, so Miat Thet, as I said, is director of the Enlightened Myanmar Research Foundation, um, and as um, Emma mentioned in the film we've just seen, um, she was also. Um, pivotal in a project called Reducing Inequalities in Public Engagement in Myanmar, which um, I was very honoured to, uh, to support her on as, as with the rest of the team on GRMPP. Um, I think, if I'm, if I'm not completely mistaken, that Mietzet's going to talk about um, how the state kind of shapes discourses and creates national identity and the, you know, the suppression of other, other knowledges and other identities impaled in doing that. So, Miat Fett, would you like to unmute yourself and, and turn your video on? Um, I, I cannot uh, turn my video on. Um, uh, yes. Danny, who is our wonderful tech support okay. today. Oh, there we have. Perfect. Yeah, thank Lord, you. Me at that. Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you very much, Emma, for organizing this important panel, which in fact is about the reflections and evaluation of the knowledge system based on our own experience. It is very important to understand our existing knowledge and the knowledge system, how knowledge was and has been created, distributed, consumed, and applying it in order to deal with different issues of social war. The work I see is an effort to bring justice to the existing knowledge system, which I see is very fundamental to bring peace and sustainable development to all the people on the world. Um, so um, 
I will uh, let me share uh, my uh, PowerPoint in order to yeah make more descriptive. So actually, um, it is not very long that I myself learn about how our existing knowledge and the process that we gain knowledge and application of that knowledge could have and are having significant impact on our attitudes and behavior towards other people. And this could in turn produce and total negative consequences for other people and the society as a whole. The instance that bring me the message was my distorted knowledge about Rohingyas. Not until 2015 September when I visited three Rohingya villages in northern and central part of Rakhine state, I knew Rohingyas as illegal migrants from Bangladesh creating such stories with the purpose of seeking asylum in Western developed countries uh, through in-depth uh, conversations, focus group discussions, and in-person observation in three Rohingya villages, I learned that they have been living there for a long time, generations by generations, maybe for over hundreds of years. They have similar livelihoods like other people in our rural areas. They do farming, fishing, and laborers in the farmland. They are like other people in our countryside, very friendly to, to the guests, and we're very happy to receive guests. But one significant thing, unlike majority of the people in Myanmar, is that they have been suffering and told experience of long-term institutionalized discriminations by state and non-state actors at different levels and different scale of citizen, different scale uh, from citizenship rights at country level to travel and mobility restrictions at state and township level to restrictions of marriages, housing and household registrations at household level and physical and psychological violence at individual level. But I didn't know that at all before that trip. People in my research team didn't know either. Also, my family didn't know that they, even though uh, my father told me one time that that people called Rohingya once existed in Myanmar and that he had been part of frequently that there is a radio program run Myanmar state in their languages like other programs in other several other ethnic languages. But uh, he, didn't, he didn't know about their long-term uh, and total sufferings by institutionalized discriminations. Actually, many people didn't know that and didn't talk about them at all. Why? Since that time, I, I tried to find out more about the knowledge distortions and knowledge uh, gaps that we are having in our society. So I put a knowledge reflection session in some of the research philosophy trainings that I gave. The knowledge reflection sessions is an exercise in which the trainees are to identify one fact about Myanmar that they knew before, which they recently found out as wrong or uh, having uh, incompleteness. What people identify frequently are, oh, I thought for a long time that Myanmar only have eight ethnic groups, or I thought that the Nu and Pao are also Shans. And or I, I thought that Mun only uh, speak uh, Myanmar 
even though they have their own language. Or I thought Muslims are very cruel and bad and they plotted to take Myanmar. Or I, I took that the Buddhism in, Myan in Myanmar is all the best in the world and so on. So why we have such misperception even about our country, our society, our own people, our culture, yeah, I did, I did not think our country alone is an exception. The political theory of knowledge is very helpful to understand the problem. A man is different experts. I would like to highlight Hans Weiler's presentation of the relationship of reciprocal legitimation between knowledge and power. What that means is that power legitimize knowledge and by vice versa. Let me elaborate the concept by giving examples. The common examples that knowledge legitimize power is the universities and think tanks advocacy and supply of data as evidences in support of certain government proposed policies and programs. Uh, the example of uh, power legitimize knowledge is such as uh, the state's decisions on school's curriculum, what is to be learned and to be taught at schools, or what kind of research are going to be done or found by state. I would argue that our incomplete or distorted knowledge about our own country is largely attributable to legitimization of knowledge by power that is Myanmar state and are different authoritarian regimes, particularly as decision on what is to be learned and to be taught at schools and universities. The Myanmar state and are different regimes since the first parliamentary government led by UNU to Nguyen's one party social, socialist authoritarian regime to military hunter to today's NLD led government practice national identity building agenda. The state frames that the Burma Buddhists as the culture of the largest ethnic groups in the country and expect minorities to assimilate rather than developing an overarching share identity. With the purpose of building national identity, according to Nick Chisman, the Tainda truth regime, Tainda means national race, the Tainda truth regime in order to justify authoritarian state building constructed by the two, by, by the two military junta, one led by General Nguyen who seized power through a military coup in 1962 and another through the coup in 1988 significantly contributes in building and instilling discriminatory concepts on which the primacy of the Burma Buddhist identity was enforced. The Tainda Truth Regime depicted that all national races who were split during colonial rule were brought together in a unity during Nguyen's socialist era. The Tainda Truth Regime was reinforced after 1988 democratic mass revolutions where the military state depicted a country called Myanmar as a single political community comprised of all national races, united in a struggle against the common external and internal enemies. However, the apparent support for Burma, rather than other national races were contradicted in practice as the two military authoritarian regimes violently added using military and state bureaucratic forces against those members of national races who did not act in accordance with their constructed truth regime. The Tainda truth regime was utilized to build the citizenship regime of 1982, which limited the membership of Myanmar's political community to the recognized national races, thereby excluding Rohingyas. So, what we taught about Myanmar history and ethnic relations and cultures at schools and the state's determination of 
National Identity Building. It is the Burma who built the first, the second, and the third, and the fourth Myanmar state. It is mainly Burma who led the revolutions against British imperialism that all national races were together with Burma in this revolution. It was General Aung San who organized the fourth Myanmar state together with other ethnic leaders. However, there, are ins there were insurgents sprang up based on ideological and racial differences. The insurgents, however, were eventually defeated by the government and so on. This is how we, this is what we learn through the public education. How can we build true federal democracies with all those shits of knowledge instilled by schools under the exclusive national identity building of Myanmar state? We also have to pay attention to the societal actors, in addition to state actors, when we consider the power, when we consider the power legitimize the knowledge. This means it is the powerful groups in the society who decide what literatures, art forms, and flames are to be made, uh, are to be made public or not to be public. One of the clear examples happened recently. This was the rejection of reciting poems about Rohingyas by some of the influential Burma poets during the, the ser poem reciting ceremonies of Diamond Jubilee of the University of Yango. This is very shameful. In short, it is the knowledge legitimized by power in terms of state as well as societal institutions matters in Myanmar creating very exclusionary forms of knowledge that create prolonged armed and communal conflicts in Myanmar. So how can in inclusive knowledge be created? Please ask questions during Q&A session. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Mia, that so much. Um, I think actually Emma posted posted in the chat, you know, we um, I introduced this panel um, by talking about hierarchies of knowledge, but Mia, that's actually introduced uh, another element, um, which is about exclusionary knowledges, but also ignorance as well. Um, you know, and how the forces of history and politics kind of cohere to create these truth regimes that make uh, inclusive knowledge in institutionally impossible and actually leads to quite traumatic experiences and conflict. Um, so maybe that's something that we can, we can kind of pick up on and discuss uh, during the Q&A session. Um, we've got two, two questions posed in the Q&A so far. So I do encourage everyone to, to post your questions there um, and we'll come to them at the, at the end of the presentations. Um, now we move over to Suet Haile Selassie Tadese from Ethiopia, um, who received uh, funding and support from ourselves at the Global Research Network on Parliaments and People uh, to pursue a project, uh, an interdisciplinary project on integrating Ethiopia's youth into um, democratic and peace processes. And I think so it's going to give us um, another perspective. So we've kind of, you know, Emma has introduced us to the, to the transnational perspective about, you know, hierarchies of knowledge. And Mia that has brought us into um, the context of Myanmar. Um, so these kind of national tensions and, and regimes of truth and exclusion. I think Suid is going to focus more on the experiences, you know, of, of effectively being a black woman trying to um, trying to create and inhabit space to talk about you know issues that affect her and everyone else's lives um, and how that's affected socially and culturally. Um, so Sue, if you could unmute yourself 
and show yourself. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jess. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, this is uh, an area uh, that I actually love to talk about informally, and it's a pleasure to have the formal space to, to discuss this uh, topic, whose knowledge matters, uh, who has voice to articulate or narrate their experience. The conversation matters because she who has voice sets the agenda, gets a seat at the table, and makes the decisions, or at the very least, influences those that do. As uh, Ted said, power reinforces knowledge and vice versa. Um, and that by definition, uh, having knowledge could, could be construed as power. And while working on the research project that I'm going to talk about a little bit, uh, I got a chance to reflect on whose knowledge matters when talking about politics in Ethiopia. Uh, the nuances that separate the lived experience of everyday politics from the grander realm of political decision making and governance, the differences between being political or a politician and an active citizen, if there is any difference at all, the different layers of identities that privilege some and exclude others from knowledge production that sets the political agenda. As I speak, I may navigate my reflections with different, within different contexts and uh, many, the many standpoints that I've occupied throughout this process. And I hope you'll be patient on, with me on that. Um, our project, uh, Embracing Dissent, Youth, Political Participation, and Peace Building, is a result of an interesting professional collaboration that resulted from a disagreement. Um, during the validation of uh, the UN Security Council Resolution 2250 on youth peace and security, I got into a heated debate with one of the authors on how youth and dissent should be framed in the progress report. I was one of the youth representatives uh, from Africa and being from a country that had just come out of the longest state of emergency um, in its history, a state of emergency that was declared due to youth protests, I had a few things to say on the matter. Uh, my research partner, on the other hand, who's the, uh, who's the author that I got into the disagreement with, uh, was originally from Turkey, uh, then living in the United States, had also his own perspectives. And the rest, as we say, is history. Our study uh, focuses on positive resilience, um, uh, the capabilities and the leadership of young people in urban centers of Ethiopia to build peace uh, and practice peaceful dissent. And, and there are some young people like that in Ethiopia, uh, despite the dominant narratives currently. Keeping in mind uh, the complexities in Ethiopian politics in general and youth political participation in particular, uh, the research took a grounded approach. We didn't want to bring any of our biases and knowledge into um, how we saw our res uh, research participants or our results. And we use reflexivity in our audiovisual uh, production as well as our interaction with participants uh, using a participatory action research methodology. Um, and youth agency was at the center of it. And let me tell you, this was really hard to convince as being valid or even feasible for a lot of my colleagues uh, here in Ethiopia um, and a lot of the experts in Ethiopian politics that we uh, talked to for advice. Um, and we observed certain things. Um, one, of our, uh, one of our observations was on the politics of silence um, and how that might affect the knowledge production process. Even if we spoke, remarked an interviewee who was once um, a political activist, we would not be listened to. Uh, there is generally limited tolerance for public dissent in politics where I come from. In fact, there's even limited tolerance for public dissent anywhere in the socio-political arena, including standing up to your parents when they're doing something dumb and expressing that it is dumb in public will get you into a whole lot of trouble. I'm just trying to give you context. Um, in, in, in a context where hierarchy, especially age-based hierarchy, uh, are strictly adhered to, there's little room for dissent. However, there's considerable dissent in silence itself. Um, John Abenik called this 
uh, uh, referred to this as deference as a survival strategy when uh, critiquing Ethiopian political participation post the 2005 uh, elections that was cont contested and resulted in massive protests. The second thing that we observed was the gender dimension of exclusion, even within youth movements. Um, the feminization of fear and nonviolence, uh, which may be common face, uh, commonplace in, in our political discourses, um, was well expressed uh, by one former online youth activist who was imprisoned uh, by the former Ethiopian administration. He said, you have voice when you're violent in this country. In the context where controversy and violence speaks, nonviolent youth are rendered voiceless. The voices of young people are not just marginalized, they're actively excluded, overlooked, and silenced and ignored. Added to this, the gender dynamics in which power is expressed, young women's voices are relatively scarce and muted in comparison to their male cohort. Young men are dominant in politics. You see them everywhere, on the streets, on the job market, in insurgent movements and perpetra as perpetrators of crime globally. And in Ethiopia, you, it is even more prominent as young women's voices are rendered uh, to the background. Um, but they both face the same social, socioeconomic and political problems, even maybe more starkly faced by young women. And one of the main findings of our research is that young women in Ethiopia have voice and they exercise their tactical agency for peace and maybe not in more mainstream ways. Um, we really wanted to highlight that political participation for young people is not a standalone issue because there are other multiplicities of exclusion and marginalization. Uh, when studying the lived experience of young people, it's very important for me to emphasize using the intersectional lens because political inclusion and exclusion from the perspective of young people is always interacting with economic and social exclusion compounded with culture and historical contexts. Um, when, when talking about lived experience, uh, it reminds me of, uh, we asked our participants to draw or describe how, what they visualize when they think about peace. And a visually impaired man, a uh, young man described what he thinks when he thinks about peace. And he said that it's the shade, the feeling of shade of a big tree in the center of town where they used to walk, uh, uh, where we used to take shelter on a hot day. He's referring to a town in uh, the town uh, called Gondar in Ethiopia, in Northern Ethiopia, where he's originally from. And the tree is a fig tree that is found in the center of town that's called Janta Kalwarka. Um, another participant talked about a daisy an Ethiopian daisy, an Ethiopian yellow daisy, set in the nozzle of an AK-47 sitting upside against a wall. This participant was originally from Arbaminch in the southern region, and her uncle was part of the military. So this was um, her memory, her recollection of what peace used to look like, but the daisy was her very own touch. Even experiences of safety and security within similar contexts can vary considerably due to lived experience of violence. Um, one participant told us, I do not know much about guns until recently. Now I can tell you what kind of bullet is being shot in my neighborhood. I do not feel safe in the city. Even with old police, I do not feel safe. She said, um, I, if I feel safe in the church, at least in church, you're not alone. This is a participant who's a resident of Duredawa another uh, city in Ethiopia. Uh, another girl who's originally from the Gambela region, uh, who once lived in Gondar, uh, remarked because of the shooting in church that she experienced a while back, I will no longer run to church if there's conflict. My friends were shot in church. In the Young people's resilience agency and leadership is evident throughout uh, Ethiopia. Uh, one is through institutions. Um, in 2005, after the contested election, there was a, 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 a law that was put in place uh, that basically inhibited the civil society sector. Um, but 
some youth-led organization found, found some youth-led organizations found uh, a way to indirectly influence policy and practice through strategic engagement. Uh, this youth-led organization survived uh, uh, the 2005 CSO law, one of the few to survive. Um, throughout the challenge for funding and the inhibitions around and they attribute their resilience to quiet advocacy, working with and not confronting the government. Um, a strategy that came with experience and very um, aggressively um, uh, challenging uh, civil society organization when it started, but grew through their learning and passed on their knowledge through those that came after. Um, so whose knowledge matters? And here's it's important to address that we had challenges working collaboratively with my research partner. Um, while one of the main objectives of the research was to implement a youth-led, youth-centered research project, identities and perception played a considerable role in successfully engaging in certain spaces and contexts. Certain spaces were more accessible to me than they were to him and vice versa. Uh, depending on the context that we we were operating in, um, I'd like to conclude by I, I would like to conclude by remarking that with the opening up of civic space in two thousand eight, and be, perhaps because of the continuous setbacks since in Ethiopia, it's important to redefine young people's political engagement. While it may seem to be an immature or maybe premature recommendation, young people may be the most important social category for a peaceful political transition process. While there's an abundant uh, abundance of media attention on violent youth actors and actions, we, we dismiss the ways in which millions of uh, young Ethiopian uh, people remain peaceful and dedicate their lives to steer political change and serve their communities through uh, peaceful means. Uh, despite the complex realities of Ethiopia, the Ethiopian political space, it's important to highlight the different intersecting realities um, of youth, uh, including the lived experiences of exclusion and marginalization they face, as well as the nonviolent ways they choose to engage in everyday politics. In our field work, we observed what we dubbed um, considerable civic appetite in universities, in informal as well as formal settings and youth spaces. Given safe spaces, young people in Ethiopia are ready to engage. Thank you. Thanks, Suet. Um, somebody, um, while you were talking, um, posted in the chat how we how we've moved from you know these there are these multiple layers involved, right, in, um, in decolonizing knowledge. So from Emma's kind of focus on foreign influence to Mia Fett's focus on, on um, national elites. And now I think you've brought a, a really valuable third kind of layer to the conversation, um, which is about lived experience and kind of, you know, the internalization of socio-cultural um, expectations. Um, and how they act to to silence uh, people and their knowledge, um, but also how actually silence can also, I, I think you said, you know, um, is it can be a productive form of dissent as well, you know, and how to how to balance those two. Um, I'd like to invite the panelists to all unmute themselves and bring themselves back on video, if I may. We've got some great questions lined up for you guys so far. Um, so Sue and me at that. If you'd like to unmute yourself, I think. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, all of you, you it's, a, it's a reminder of why I've enjoyed working with all of you so much and the kinds of, you know, the, the kind of thoughtful encounters um, that we've kind of co-produced, right, um, throughout, throughout the GRMPP kind of endeavour, if I can call it that. Um, we have about 45 minutes because we do have to be off at 2.45 for the, for the keynote. So what I propose is um, 
I think all the panelists can actually see the questions, um, but if I take them in, in turn, and if I can, although I think uh, some of them are actually directed towards specific panelists, you know, I invite the others to also um, weigh in as well. Um, so Riyadh, thank you very much. Um, you had a question for Emma, which was that, uh, which was, have you encountered language barriers in navigating your projects? For example, in disseminating knowledge in local languages, communicating with local people. And I think actually that's something that, that the other panelists can also, can also answer because, yeah. Definitely, language. Uh, is probably one of the most important issues that we talked about uh, continually throughout the project. So our big problem um, sitting in SOAS is uh, our inability to speak um, the languages of Myanmar or Ethiopia. Um, if they only had one language each, then maybe we could have struggled to try and learn some. Uh, however, between the two countries, you have more than 150 languages. I mean, there's an incredible proliferation of languages. And if you work in, in the dominant language, you then are automatically excluding people. Um, so it's not even as simple as, say, of trying to translate, for example, our, all our materials into Amharic and uh, Burmese, say, for example. Uh, because um, that would just privilege certain people within each of those countries. So it, to, I would love it if um, Siwa and Mittet uh, would, would say something about language in their particular context. But um, the only final thing I, I wanted to say was that for me, it does connect with intellectual property rights because our point was we had no claim over the research data of any of the people we were working with, whether they were running uh, a partner organization as Mirtet is, uh, or, or they were um, uh, running a, a research project like Suet. So since they were entire, they had full, full ownership of their own research findings, it didn't matter in a way what language they published in. So it was really important to us that people should have the liberty to publish in any language. W our, agenda was about was about trying in a way to challenge the hierarchies of knowledge and the way that funding is distributed uh, and to give people total control over their own research so it was really important that they should have total control of their uh, and ownership over their property their research data and um, could choose which audiences they wanted to communicate to in whichever language they wished do you want to do you want to say something to that? Um, just um, uh, I mean, for, I mean, for the sorry, uh, for the <laughs> I'm reading the question. So, uh, uh, you mean the follow up uh, to uh, Emma's or my other yes, question? Yes. Yeah. About about the. Uh, uh, about language and the role of language in disseminating knowledge and kind of knowledge sharing. Yeah, actually, um, um, the language do matters in, um, in I would say, uh, creating uh, inclusion or exclusion knowledge, right? So um, actually, uh, even uh, in Myanmar, um, even um, uh, even though sometimes we, I mean, most of the time we realize that even when we realize the the when we use the whenever we use the language of a majority Burma people, uh, this is. Uh, actually uh, partially uh, exclusions of many ethnic people uh, who, um, un, um, who, have, um, who, who have a language barri uh, barriers uh, in uh, Burmese language, right? So uh, language uh, do a, yeah, a lot of uh, matters 
in uh, inclusion or exclusion knowledge, right? But still, uh, language is um, also important for communicating among mankind between us. We need a language that we can communicate all of us. So we have to create language that we can communicate all of us. Yes, of sometimes um, in uh, the, the language of the international language such as uh, English is one of them, but uh, how we can uh, try efforts of creating uh, uh, arts forms or other uh, descriptive things, you know, um, other than language, you know, cartoons, paintings, dance, you know, um, we, can, we can use many, you know, arts forms we, uh, to communicate uh, among human, human beings so that uh, we can create uh, inclusive ways of knowledge. Yeah, thank you. You've preempted one of the questions that I had lined up, Mietze, for for all of you, which was about, um, you know, thinking about language, um, you know, falling back to Riyadh's question, the way that Emma answered it, you know, you think about actual language as opposed to, well, how about, how, how about thinking creatively about not language per se, but what language does, which is that helps us communicate with each other and build relationships with each other, right? Um, so you, you completely preempted my question about, you know, what other ways um, are there um, to build and, uh, and pursue more inclusive knowledge and, and relationships? Stuart, would you like to comment on this? Yeah, um, language is a complex topic in Ethiopia. So, um... I might not entirely take it literally as, as you've suggested, Jazz. Um, so my, my research partner was an English speaker and I spoke one of the national languages, one of the local languages, Amharic, which in itself could be exclusionary. And what we did in the interviews, it was pretty simple to have those exchanges, but I, what we did in the focus groups is we, I, I disinvited my research partner and told him he's not welcome. That's one of the, the ways to pre preempt that exclusion for others so that they don't have to speak strictly, that, so that the young people don't have to speak strictly in English. Um, but then we found another hiccup because one of the participants from, from the Gambella region uh, only spoke English, did not speak Amharic. Um, so uh, it was interesting to have that mixed language um, interaction in the focus groups, which basically just gave leeway for people to, to speak in the language of their heart and for me as the researcher to observe and understand and try to relate as much as possible. And uh, to ask questions in such a way that they don't really need to answer in words, but actually to draw, um, which, which, which was uh, to do drawings. And I have some very interesting drawings as answers to uh, some of the questions uh, that we raised. Uh, to the visualization and the drawing processes. Um, so maybe not having dry Q&A processes, but actually uh, allowing for other forms of creativity and other forms of um, responses to emerge in whatever language that um, the, particip the participant feels comfortable with. Uh, would come up with very interesting. Uh, I mean, the, the, the visually impaired man, uh, I, I had to sit next to and say, we're doing this exercise. Um, what do you visualize when you think about peace? And this man is telling me to draw a tree and I'm a horrible drawer, but um, a tree and describing it to me, that conversation would not have been feasible if it wasn't using that particular methodology, if it was a dry Q and A process. And I thought that was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, thanks, Riyadh, for the for the question, which I think we the panelists have managed to kind of open up and take in directions um, beyond perhaps what you were expecting. Um, there are a couple of questions. Um, one from Kevin, who uh, says, "Why are we viewed the same way in Malaysia? You know, um, they've they've become more aware." that this has become heightened during the COVID uh, crisis. Um, yet that I know 
um, you will likely have a lot to say about that. Um, but perhaps you just want to want to briefly talk to Kevin's point. Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, honestly speaking, I I don't know uh, about um, how uh, Rohingyas are uh, uh, viewed in uh, Malaysia, uh, but I would say that um, Rohingyas actually have been suffered discriminations. Uh, I mean, in Myanmar, not by the majority uh, non Rohingya. I uh, mean, not by, uh, not only by majority, uh, Burma and um, other, you know, uh, people who consider or who are uh, considered as a national races. Uh, in even in Myanmar, Rohingyas are discriminated uh, even by Muslims. Uh, in Myanmar, uh, Rohingyas. I mean, the, I mean, the Muslims who consider themselves as Burmese Muslims call Rohingyas here in Myanmar as a court okala, and uh, they discriminated uh, them. So uh, I would say that this is the, the, what I think is this is the social boundary between, uh, uh, between us, between between the people in Myanmar society, social boundary building. So uh, this is actually, uh, what, what I mean is the othering to each other. So I think the Rohingyas in uh, Malaysia are being uh, discriminated or uh, viewed as the same way as in Myanmar because of those social boundary building buildings making, um, Make, making them as other. Yeah, here in Myanmar, Rohingyas are being viewed as uh, uh, making, uh, view as uh, uh, fearsome others from the Western Gate. So for, for non Rohingya Muslim in Myanmar, uh, the majority uh, people, uh, majority non Muslim people in Myanmar, um, uh, including uh, uh, those uh, who, uh, who are non Buddhist, Nema, uh, uh, take that, uh, take, um, uh, take uh, Muslim as a fearsome and disgusting others. And for Rohingya as a fearsome and disgusting others from the Western gates. And, and now they are also considered as a, you know, uh, uh, extremist. So this is actually, uh, the, social, the long term social boundary makings, this is also uh, reinforced by states' uh, ident national identity building. Thank you. Thanks, Mia. But actually, um, for if, if you're interested, Kevin, and anyone else, uh, one of the GRMPP uh, projects um, that was funded looked at the kind of the making and the changing trajectory and identity and status of the Rohingya. Um, so you're welcome to go on on the grmpp.org, I think our website now is, because we, we overhauled it this summer, and search for Nazir, N-A-S-I-R, um, and you'll come across the, the details of his project, which I think speaks to uh, something that Mia Thet is touching on, which is, you know, and Kevin, you, you also have touched on, which is actually um, to open up uh, space for comparative research and inquiry, right, into the treatment of of the Rohingya or of uh, of all dispossessed peoples, you know, and seeing how how they compare. So I think that's a that's a fertile ground. Um, an anonymous uh, somebody who, who's chosen to remain anonymous uh, that has posed a question. Um, I think so. This this really speaks to the the idea of the internalization of kind of family and social and cultural values. Um, or attorney says, I come from a minority ethnic group myself and find that often I am silencing myself and holding back from conversations because I've internalized my family and culture's expectations regarding women and girls. So 
the question, you know, I don't think we'll have all the answers, is how can we hope to change these values at the family level so that actually parents become a source of empowerment for their children to speak up um, and to demand inclusiveness for themselves. No pressure, panelists. <laughs> Actually, on, uh, on overcoming the gender inequalities. <laughs> Sue it. It's yeah, this is actually a personal question, yeah? Um, because it's about learning and unlearning things that you've un internalized throughout and, and where you have voice and where you don't, which you in turn um, hand over to your children or those that you influence. Uh, shushing someone in, in, in um, spiritual spaces, because you're not supposed to interrupt the patriarchal leader of the, whichever that is. Um, this is this is about being conscious of, of, of what it is that you've been silenced and have internalized in terms of silence throughout your life and actually challenging yourself to unlearn them and in turn not to pass it on to, to the next generation. And, and, and as a mother, I, I completely hear your, um, your concern because I uh, I have felt like a complete um, outsider, like um, an, an imposter um, doing this research on youth political participation, where I have been one of those quiet, silent youth throughout, uh, I don't know if I, in Africa, I'm still a young person. So um, it, it's, it's been very challenging to claim that voice to say that I have opinions on political matters. And it's uh, it has been about, unlearning and challenging myself to challenge others that have in turn tried to silence me and also the things that I've done to silence myself. And it's it's an ongoing process because um, if you if you go into if you're in social media spaces, you see a lot of women that are saying, I don't know much about politics, but but we do know a lot about politics. We're struggling for equality and to overcome oppression on our day to day, just to claim our seat on the table in, in within our family. Um, so I, I don't I don't agree with with that assertion that I don't know much about politics or that I don't have voice in certain spaces. And that's just inequalities reinforcing themselves to ensure that a large majority remains silent. And I think voice is really important and claiming that voice in itself is feminist action, which I am all for. So I think um, just just keep reflecting and, and, and challenging yourself to overcome what you have internalized throughout your life uh, is what I would say, which I am still doing. So won't say that I've overcome it. Thanks. Yes, Emma. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's always such a relief when somebody else says they feel an imposter or something similar, because, you know, it makes something, oh, phew. So, you know, even if so, if so, it feels like that, then it's OK for me to feel like that, too. So I think I think actually the question in itself is is a very powerful question, because by asking it and getting us all to talk about this more openly, um, that, you know, that, that in itself has a tremendous value. So don't you find that the discussion of it is important, but also having allies where, you know, there's this anth amazing anthropologist called um, Marilyn Strathern, who wrote a, a very short little note about the, the crisis of confidence she sometimes has when she's writing. And I, again, I just think, okay, this is a shared experience. This isn't just me. Um, but I do, I, I am very conscious of the fact that even though I've got this tremendous privilege, I feel these moments of doubt. So what's it like when you're getting all these, you know, messages, political messages from every direction um, that your knowledge is not as valued? And that's why I really, really mind about this. Um, and, and I suppose the only thing I would challenge you about, Suet, is you made it sound like it's all up to you. But I, I think it's... It, we, know, we need to think about how we can show solidarity to each other. It's a collective enterprise, isn't it, to challenge these things? Um, am, I, am I answering it, Jeff? Yes, or? yeah, absolutely. Okay. Let's get this conversation going. <laughs> okay, um, I don't want you to think that I'm being overly polite to, G to, to you and and Rich and, uh, and yourself, Beth, but um, in the experience that I've had doing this research where I was 
constantly being questioned to speak on this issue. Um, I think the way that, that, that this program was structured in giving me legitimacy and me the power to say, this is what I wanna study um, has been an enabler. So in, in, in that sense, you've been my allies um, in, in enabling that and enabling me to, to keep pushing back. Um, so yes, definitely agree with you that you need allies and you need uh, people around you that are conscious, but also think that there's a profound personal process in, in unlearning and, and challenging yourself to challenge others um, and whether or not you belong in that space. Uh, so I don't think it's a mutually exclusive kind of situation, Emma, to answer your question. I think you do need support externally, but it's also a very profound and transformative internal process to question, unlearn, and, 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 and develop that voice uh, um, to speak out on issues that you've been told that you can't speak out on. Um, so, you know, we're both right, yeah. basically. Yeah, we probably are. Um, can I just <laughs> say one more thing, Jazz, because this also yeah. relates to... Yeah the way that Mirtata and I have been working, because um, I think one has to look at this kind of thing from different directions, because sometimes both Mirtat, you, and so at you, have pointed out that me or Rich or whoever it is, actually don't really need to be in the room. And, you know, I think lots of humans, including me, have a kind of tendency to be slightly control freaks. Um, but actually that can be very undermining of people. And sometimes actually, uh, you have challenged us to see where we're not needed. So I guess we can take some credit for being attentive to what you're saying, but nonetheless, you have still had to remind us, both of you. I think Is that not true, Mitt? That sometimes you've had to point out where actually our, our involvement is really not, not so useful. And that's been really, really useful that you're, you, you felt able to say that. Uh. Actually, uh, um, I I found uh, yes, uh, there. I mean, there there might be some occasions. Uh, I mean, you are not useful, but uh, in the I mean, I mean, actually, this is what I'm saying is not trying to be polite to you, you know. Uh, uh, but when I find out uh, that generally uh, the whole uh, process and um what i think is um what uh we use i mean what are what are the things uh, from you that is useful for us is um um uh, the i would say um the you know trust confidence and um uh, um listening to uh, to us i mean give i mean giving uh, time to listen to us uh, yeah so uh, and then um give us um the full autonomy uh to uh, to implement the project you know, not only implement to design the projects, you know, uh, together, you know, uh, I mean, it's uh, actually uh, designing of the projects is actually weaving our knowledge. So it is actually, it's, it's very, uh, you know, uh, creative, you know. So, it, so um, I think uh, in those points, you know, uh, designing a project or programs uh, with uh, through a brainstorming sessions, you know, uh, listening to each other, uh, giving time to each other is uh, really matters uh, to to be include uh, to make a, a inclusive ways of workings and uh, yeah. So I those 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 are the points I think. Uh, we all are useful to each other. Yeah, yeah. That's really interesting hearing you all, all speak um, brings to mind very strongly this sense of, of the need when you're talking about knowledge hierarchies, knowledge exclusions, it, 
um, you know, along multiple levels and layers is that actually it's about strong relationships is what I, I feel you're all kind of, you know, talking about, talking about establishing strong relationships and actually those relationships where, you know, um, for, for everyone who, who's listening, you know, we have, we can have as, as a team within GRMPP, but also with me at FET. And so we, we can have quite difficult and tense like conversations sometimes. And we have had over the, over the last two and a half years of working together, but actually there are, you, you kind of navigate um, difficult terrain and establish trust so that it's possible, for example, as, as Sue it did do uh, during an event, good goodness, almost a year ago, um, you know, saying actually, GRMPP, you guys need to get out of the room. We here are a cohort of Ethiopian scholars and we want to figure this out on our own. We'll let you know when you can come back. Um, similarly, when I've worked closely with me at FET on a project, you know, I've, I've I put on this very bureaucratic hat sometimes and kind of said to me at FET, the project isn't, you know, isn't delivering what we promised by the time we promised it. And me at FET would just kind of go, ease up jazz i know what i'm doing i'm the one in myanmar she didn't say this in, in such terms but you know you're, you're kind of the far and you don't really know what's going on actually these processes are far more difficult you know and she explained about needing um to establish relationships of trust and care with people in myanmar to advance uh, the reducing inequalities in public engagement project that actually actually we worked on um so relationship seems to me, you know, this kind of pivotal core to, to everything, inclu including uh, creating more inclusive knowledge. Um, Can I give an example, Jess? Sorry, I know you want to get to the questions, but I think this yes. is what I found very interesting is that is that because um, Suet talked about how her project came out of a disagreement. So I find it very interesting thinking about when are disagreements constructive and when are they destructive? And the way it works with me at TED uh, so far, inshallah, is that it, you always have a sense of movement. So the other day I went uh, to, to Myanmar just before the lockdown and me at TED wanted to create a new project. So I said, okay, me at TED, what do you want to do? And she said, well, this is my analysis, a bit like today, that kind of analysis, um, because all our work in Myanmar has basically been based on me at TED's analysis, me at TED and her colleagues. So she said, this is what I want to do. So I went away and thought about it overnight. And then I went back the next day. I said, so Mitta, have I understood you? Is this what you want to do? And she, she looked at me very patiently, very politely and said, hmm, no, you haven't understood at all. Here, let me explain again. But actually the way she explained again did incorporate something about what I said because she took on board that that, you know, let's say I made a reference to the SDGs or something that would help the potential funder to understand what she was saying. So in fact, uh, what I think is really interesting about collaboration is if you always have that sense of movement in the face of disagreement, that's, that's the kind of work I find exciting. Yeah, but we mustn't ignore our question as well. No, no, thank you though. As, as I think everyone can tell, we, can, we, we could probably do this all day, couldn't we? <laughs> Quite um, I'm. I apologise. I know we mentioned this. We have workmen in the house. If you hear lots of banging, I apologise. Hopefully, it doesn't uh, doesn't affect your, uh, your participation and enjoyment of the session. Paul Taylor has has started by saying it's a bit of a leading question that they want to ask. Um, I'm interested to know what the panelists think about the language we use to describe our nation's historic eras of governance. Um, and how they bias our interpretations. I'm thinking about words like regime, authoritarian, junta, um, democratic, civilian. You know, the labels we kind of attach to different historical political um, times. Um, once an era has a label, we become blind to issues um, that are char characteristic of, you know, other labels, for example. So if we, you know, uh, identify, uh, I think he's saying, you know, a state as democratic, does that make us blind to its authoritarian aspects? And then less able to enforce a critical lens um, about national truths and how it's constructed. Is that something anyone wants to, uh, wants to pick up on? You know, how, how the use of labels and naming effectively um 
creates, um, I guess, hierarchies of knowledge and excludes other forms of analysis from, uh, from taking shape. It depends on who we is when, when he's talking about we. Uh, I, I don't think when you're living in an authoritarian government and that calls itself democratic that you actually believe that it's democratic. You might not use those words to describe the situation um, as autocratic or democratic, but you definitely know that you're being oppressed and that is your lived reality. Um, so it depends on who we is that that sort of um, almost uh, a constructed way of representing a certain context does not necessarily mean that the people living in that context are not aware of their state of oppression. I, I don't know if I'm answering the, the question or not, but that's my personal opinion. Yeah, I, you you make me think. I think um, because Emma and I are both anthropologists. Um, can you hear me? I can't actually hear myself. Think um, we're anthropologists. I think this is a really interesting question, right? Because it's about the fact that there are these kind of multiplicity of truths out there. So I actually find the idea of of labeling quite interesting because I think it opens up onto uh, onto the many perspectives and the many lived experiences. Um, that together kind of, you know, form, form an understanding. Yeah, Anna. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a really, it's a really great question because um, there are lots of claims that are made by different groups of people. I agree with Suet. You need to pay very close attention to who's making the claim. But there are all kinds of claims. I mean, I guess we used to claim we were a civilized nation, um, you know, and when Mahatma Gandhi visited London, he was asked, you know, what do you think of civilization? And he said, well, I think it would be a very good idea. You know, so he understood that this was just a claim. Um, there are many ways in which we were and continue to be incredibly uncivilized. Um, and, you know, when MPs say they're representing people, it's a claim. Um, when, when anyone says that their knowledge is truth, it's a claim. Actually, knowledge is always contested. It's not to say that we shouldn't struggle towards the most plausible accounts for things. But uh, yes, I think democracy, it's why we called our project uh, Deepening Democracy, because I think we would say that, that any state that says it's got democracy is, is again a claim. It's which democracy can you point to and say it works perfectly? There is none. So I think it's, I think thinking about the political strategy of making claims um, and, and deconstructing them, looking at them very critically is an important part of scrutinizing politics. I feel it's an interesting point though, but if we do have time, and I feel we may not, it would be interesting to come back to perhaps in this discussion or another one, um, because the claims to who is democratic and who is democratizing or who is in the throes of democratic transition, for example, you know, a lot of that is framed by by the development world, by the institutions that give funding. Um, so for example, you know, um, the Global Challenges Research Fund, you know, signifies that you've got to actually uh, make a proposal, a research proposal that benefits a country um, that's an OECD receiving country, right? So it's already bracketing off parts of the world as less democratic than us in the West, and I do it because, as you can tell, I, I, I sound quite British, but I, I have the, you know, dual identity. Um, so it could be something that we can, we can come back to. We have about um, 15 minutes. I'm not sure, I want to thank everyone who's, who's asked, a, asked a question so far, and hopefully we have answered, answered them. Um, May Kang, I think we've kind of already talked about this, whose knowledge matters is equally important as power legitimizing knowledge. So how do we remedy it? How can we remedy when those who legitimize the knowledge actually themselves have insufficient knowledge? Again, this is, this is the power to decide what is knowledge, isn't it? Which I, Unless anyone wants to kind of weigh in, I think yeah, yeah, Ted is ready. about that. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, insufficient knowledge of those who uh, of the of those powerful who legitimize knowledge, how we can find remedy. Actually, it's a uh, very challenging for for us for mankind. But I think it is none other than the freedom of expressions that um, that let those uh, powerful, actually not only those uh, who make the political decisions, but also the the people, the the people in the society, the majority powerful people. Uh, they they really need to learn about um, how those um, people uh, the uh, the the minorities the the disadvantaged uh, people have been suffering and have been discriminated you know so uh, through the so if so freedom of expression is the I think the foundations for us to let what the people have been uh, uh, suffer you know have been uh, uh, waged by the violence by the state and the majority people so but we have to we have to be careful uh not to blame those people in the uh societies who don't see uh those peoples uh, who are suffering uh because uh the people actually uh mean I mean they, their knowledge have been also uh, constructed uh, by this system this uh, this authoritarian uh, systems actually for us a long time actually since I would say the the um, um, monarchic monarchy monarchic eras right so uh, we I mean our point of view to see uh, the issues uh, in the country uh, not only uh, Rohingyas but also the our country's histories, our country's uh, ethnic people is quite uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, the majorities, you know. I mean, so um, we have a, a good lens to view, a different lens to view those issues. So uh, instead of blaming them, we have to find uh, ways to enlighten them using, um, uh, you know, arts, you know, um, uh, musics, and, but in all we do, uh, the freedom of expression is, is the fundamental things that we need. Yeah. Thanks, Mietha. Um, actually, and then somebody else, um, I think Elliot Rooney, who's, who's kind of uh, riffing off off your point we said about power legitimizing knowledge and what you've just said about kind of delegitimizing regressive knowledge through freedom of expression and finding alternative modalities of, of communicating yeah with with people to create more inclusive knowledge actually Elliot wants to take the conversation in a different direction and go well actually what should be the role um, of northern based um, knowledge centers um, in helping with this and really is the role of northern, northern based knowledge centers one that actually reinforces the power relationship between northern and southern knowledge based centers um yeah uh, actually um i would i would say um uh, i would i mean partly 
I will give credits to the northern, the to the to the knowledge coming from the, the from the north or the west. Um, and uh, I would also uh, have to give a uh, reminder for the for those who bring knowledge at the, at the other hand. Yeah. So first, I will give. I will first give the credits to the knowledge who who brings knowledge from the north or the west. So um, actually, uh, I would say uh, um, I, 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 I think I would give credits to the freedom of expressions and this is and, and um, this um, um, uh, the 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 established uh, learning you know uh, freedom of learning since the I think um, quite uh, from the Renaissance yes there will be ups and downs of of course uh, but uh, this this traditions of uh, freedom of learning is quite established in the Western countries yeah so this give us um, uh, you know, uh, lands to see different point of views. For example, I will give you one, one example. example of that. Just one, because time is running short. Yeah. So uh, when we look at when we look at the Rakhine State example, when we look at our borders, we Myanmar people see uh, as a west, uh, the western border, uh, the the northern of the northern Rakhine State as a the gate, you know, uh, between us and then the most Muslims were. And then this leading to the uh, discriminations and violence to this uh, group of uh, people that who they want uh, them to call, to be called as Rohingyas, right? Yeah, so, but uh, uh, the Western uh, uh, thinkings uh, I recently uh, studied, they, they they view they give me the lands uh, of this Rakhine state, which extends uh, today's uh, Bangladesh's areas. So and and the Rakhine state actually is quite detached from uh, the Eawari Valley, Myanmar. So it is actually is quite more attached to the uh, today's Bangladeshis than. Uh, areas, uh, I mean, in the, what is it is called in the 14th or 15th century as a Banga, you know, Banga or, and Chittagong area. So the Arakanese- yeah, I'm gonna have to ask you to kind of, yeah. In that, uh, that areas, right? So with this kind of view, I, I, I got a lens of how this, uh, uh, what we see as a, uh, today as a Muslim war and the Rakhine state is how culturally connected. So this is the benefits coming from the, uh, coming from the lands of the, the northern part, you know, for me, for me, yeah. Of right? course. So yeah. what would you say in response? Because we, yesterday, the, the four of us kind of got together and, and talked about what everyone would be saying and, and um, we, well, if we try to goad you into into saying something um, critical about GRMPP and, and your experience with GRMPP, and you said, you know, to be fair, GRMPP don't don't count. You know, it, 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 it's you're not pretending, and you you were very clear. You know, Emma, myself, um, and the rest of the GRMPP don't don't pretend to have any kind of fundamental knowledge. Uh, about Ethiopia, we don't know the language, etc. And you were like, the real problem with, with northern knowledge centers, if that's what we're calling it, are those who think they're actually experts. She was like, you, you've got, you guys are fine. <laughs> Do you want to elaborate on that? When I say elaborate, you've got about a minute and a bit. Yeah, um, I think the most refreshing thing about having this experience with you uh, has been that you completely acknowledge that you know nothing about a whole lot about my country and I acknowledge that I also know my own perspective from my own standpoint and don't claim to know the whole thing but um, it's when it comes to this question it's about 
what role are you playing um, as a Northern Knowledge Center um, in, in taking in Southern academics? Um, are you replicating the kind of knowledge generating uh, mechanisms uh, that you yourself would generate so that you could have data collectors, for example, uh, down south? Or are you actually enabling learning and the development of uh, intellectuals that can actually create another enabling space for local knowledge to take shape and to be articulated um, adequately? Um, is it is it you know that there's that meme with the with the knowledge centers being a replicator for exactly identical type of people coming out the other end, um, or are we actually enabling critical thinking? And I found that your team has has enabled at least a space for that to take place, for critical thinking to take place, for independent thinking to take place, which I thought was really refreshing. And I'm not saying there was no hierarchy. There was subconscious hierarchies that were happening either through my own biases or through your own experiences, but we were critical enough to stop and say, wait a minute. Um, and I have had these conversations with, especially with Emma, where she says, I'm not saying this because I'm a white woman from the UK. I'm saying this because, and, 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 and I've, I, and you know, it's, it's also about being conscious of these relationships and how these affect the knowledge creation process. And um, with my relationship with my research partner, who is an international level expert um, on youth, um, it's been the same where I have continuously pushed back and he's pushed back as well. Um, in who has who who has a perspective on the matter and whether or not we have the space to hear each other and actually develop something out of it. And I think even from the proposal writing process of this collaboration, it's been very interesting in, in claiming and reclaiming that power um, to be an equal participant in this process. And it's and 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 that need to reclaim and continuously question is because there are internalized biases on how these processes are supposed to take place, if that's making sense to you at all. It makes perfect sense to me. Um, it's, I think it's almost a question of knowing what you don't know and being brave enough, if that's the word, um, to say, I don't know. And actually to start a conversation um, and a critical friendship with people who do know and who themselves understand that their knowledge is partial as well and their perspective is partial. You know, so the way that you and Ali Altior kind of uh, kind of work together, you know, in, in that collaborative, creating that collaborative spirit and practice um, that you bring, bring to the project. I, we aren't gonna get through all the questions that may be because I talk too much. Uh, Can I say one very quick thing about yes. our, our website? Because on our website, um, www.grmpp.org, we've written a policy brief, if you go to the output library, which is about partnerships. And if anybody would go on our website um, and make comments, it, it says in the policy brief about, it's really about how can European universities be better partners? in international research coalitions. And we would love your comments, your very, very critical, brutal comments, because we'd like to improve that uh, policy brief as a way of trying to influence other UK universities to aspire, because you never get there for the reasons that have become obvious, uh, but to at least aspire to be better partners um, in international research coalitions. And actually that's a, that's a good juncture at which um, for me to thank everyone who um, has posed questions. We, I hope the panelists um, have been able to answer, answer them to your satisfaction or even to your dissatisfaction, which, you know, dissatisfaction actually can produce quite, quite kind of creative, critical thinking spaces, right? And my deepest apologies to people who've posed some really interesting questions. Um, one of which um, is rhetorical, but something that actually we need to think about, which is, you know, how does decolonization of knowledge work, given that here we are, just to take one example, I Payne says, discussing the flight of Rohingya in abstract academic English. You know, so that, that again, that's, I, I'm, um, 
I'm loath to end this session saying that we've got any answers. And actually, I think that kind of critical question is really important because it shows that the conversation can't stop here. You know, Emma, me upset. So it, thank you so much for these insights and for actually just, you know, even kind of opening the window on helping, I think, even me understand that there are so many levels and scales and layers involved in thinking about whose knowledge matters, you know, because we've got to think about what knowledge is it's, and positionalities and perspectives and the hierarchies involved, you know, language, communication, the kinds of conversations and relationships that we try to have or that we, that, you know, we silence ourselves from having and how all of this plays in um, to, to fermenting kind of, you know, um, dominant discourses and how, um, you know, that the, if there is an answer, and I don't even propose to pretend there is one, is that maybe one of the way forwards is to form critical friendships and learn how to be better allies with each other. Um, so we're each speaking our own truths, but doing so, you know, in tandem and by listening to everyone else's truths at the same time and trying to trying to strategize do be better um i'm afraid i can't give you any kind of last comments uh we've hit 245 thank you so much to everyone who's participated um please go on to www.grnpp.org if you'd like to learn more about the global research network and um, engage with research like Suet and Mia Fetz and other peoples on a range of topics relating to uh, the relationship between politi uh, politicians, parliamentarians and people. Um, where, you know, our partners, our collaborators, our friends, our colleagues are all dealing with knowledge and, and whose knowledge matters in, in some, some form or the other through their research projects. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, Suet. It's lovely speaking with you as always. I, I feel like we've just had a nice chat. Um, and uh, I hope all the participants have, have, uh, have enjoyed this space. And I um, invite you to stay on this Zoom space, I think in the Zoom room for the uh, keynote lecture that's um, following as part of the SOAS Festival of Ideas. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Oh, um, sorry, and thank you to Danny, who's just been superb at making sure that this all ran really smoothly. And thank you to Stephanie, who's been organizing flat out the SOAS Festival of Ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Danny.